Hey everyone, welcome to another interview from the mind of a skeptical leftist. This is another old one from November, uh, but it was a good one. I talked to Scott J. Branson, author of the book Practical Anarchism, A Guide for Daily Life. They are also part of the Final Straw podcast, so make sure to check that out for more stuff from them. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of sad lately about Cop City and the Atlanta Forest Defenders and the tragic murder of the activist that everyone affectionately calls Tort, but this was streamed live on my Twitch uh, channel back in November, so if you've been following my stuff, then you probably already knew about uh, Cop City. Even so, I'm way behind on the current news cycle, and I definitely want to send love and solidarity to uh, all those fighting to stop Cop City, and my heart goes out to uh, uh, f the family and friends and comrades of Tor. I'm going to put some links in the show notes. There's a, a statement by from the Atlanta Forest Defenders, and uh, some links to sh where you can support them and, and how you can uh, show your support. I don't have a good transition from that, but I still have to thank my patron, especially Justin, who bumped up his pledge, and Jared, who has become a new patron. Patrons make it possible for me to do this show, and at the moment, the money that I get from Patreon is helping to pay for all the services I use to produce the show. If you want to contribute to the production of this show, then you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist. Support levels start at a dollar per month or a dollar fifty for Canadians. If you can't support me with money, then please hit the like button or go and write a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. I always need more ratings and reviews, so everyone make sure to check the links in the show notes for those. You should also subscribe on YouTube or on the podcast app of your choice so that you get new episodes as soon as they come out. Feel free to contact me by messaging on any social media. Leave a comment on YouTube uh, using the use the contact form on my website or which is skepticalleftist.com or by you can email me at mindoftheskepticalleftist at gmail.com. With that, on to the interview. <laughs> All right. Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by Scott. Thanks for joining me. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here and to talk to you. Yeah, so I guess um, a good place to start is uh, uh, a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Um, I, I guess I identify myself <laughs> as... Uh, a writer, an anarchist, a teacher, an organizer. Um, I also like make art and play music. Um, a trans femme and a Jewish person too. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, yeah, I've, I just had a book come out. So I guess that's the, the, one <laughs> of the reasons for being here is that I wrote a book on, on anarchism, uh, practical anarchism out with Pluto press. Yeah. I, uh, Unfortunately, I did not finish it. I, I'm, I'm approximately the world's slowest reader, but I, I did get through a couple chapters, and I'm quite enjoying it. So cool. Yeah, I'm glad you. I'm glad you like it. So, uh, what's what was the uh, I guess the impetus for writing the book? Well, it's interesting. Like, I never was like I'm going to be the person to write a book on anarchism because um, that <laughs> that seems like a a big thing. I don't know, it, it, <laughs> <laughs> right. And just yeah. like, just to be like, I, I mean, there's the kind of contradictory idea of like, I'm the authority and I'm going to, I'm the authority on anti-authoritarianism or <laughs> whatever. Um, yeah. but this, like I was on, I'm on this listserv of the North Amer American Anarchist Studies Network. And there was an editor who's like looking for a project on anarchism that yeah. thought about it as a kind of, you know, daily practice rather than, um, specifically focusing on direct action or like black block, the stuff that's like mostly in the news. Right. And um, when I thought about that, I was like, oh, this, this actually would coalesce some of the work I've been, or some of the things I've been thinking about and working on for the last number of years. So I made a proposal and they were in at Pluto press were into the book and I got a chance to write it. And, and now like, I'm like, oh yes, this makes sense. It's kind of like, something I needed to do. Um, I'm really glad I got the opportunity to do it because it, it just put together so many different strands of thought. And, um, and then I just hope, I hope I made something that's um, accessible to new people and also provocative for people who've been around for a while, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I find that it, uh, it really resonated with me in a lot of ways. Like I've actually, I'm, I've been working on a, a video essay script, uh, my first ever, but I wanted to break anarchism down into like the four 
kind of th- things that I thought it c- was comprised of, which is like a theory about the future, uh, an analysis of power today, and then direct action and day-to-day life. And mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, holy cow, this book really think like there's a lot of stuff in here that I was like, yeah, that's anarchism when you're living your day-to-day, when you're treating your relationships like uh, like a- in an anarchist way, like mm-hmm. removing that hierarchy, that power structure from your the way you treat other people and the way you behave. Right. I mean, you know, if there was some kind of punctual revolution where the state was overthrown and capitalism was ended, um, we'd still be carrying around all the vestiges and like the logics of the state and the market in our heads. And there's a lot of work to do to, um, to relate to one another, you know, outside of those kind of alienated conditions to re- to relate directly to people without the kind of intervention of the state and its institutions. Um, so yeah, I think it's important to start at home. Also, like I, I'm skeptical of that kind of punctual revolution idea. Also, and I, I mean, I'm not the only anarchist to think that way, obviously. Right. Yeah, it's like I, I guess a lot of people uh, talk about like social revolution rather than like the day we overthrow the government. <laughs> Right, right. One of the reasons why some of the kind of left revolutions in the past didn't work, arguably, is that there wasn't a social revolution or, or you know, that the, there was a political revolution, maybe a somewhat economic revolution, right. versions of industrial revolution or whatever. Um, but yeah, the, the, the whole kind of structure of life and culture didn't shift. Um, and that's why, like, you know, I mean, that's one of those kind of those points of uh, contention between certain forms of Marxism and anarchism is through the, the idea of the state and how the state plays yeah. in, in a role. And you end up replicating these things. So I, I feel like, yeah, if you don't um, sort of question the state logics in your head, you will start reproducing them. Um, and yeah. same same with like if you seize the state and use that as the institution of wielding power, you end up recreating hierarchies, um, yeah. even if you didn't want to have them. Yeah, for sure. One of the things that I really enjoyed uh, reading about was uh, like using your anarchism as a, a way to learn how to say no to things. And uh, like uh, you're not obligated to, you know, do everything. <laughs> <laughs> you're, right. allowed, you're allowed to say no and you're allowed to break up if relationships with friends or or, or care, other loved ones is not right for you at that time. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's sort of like the kernel of the, the like angle of anarchism that I'm taking or the theory that I'm trying to put forward. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not it's not to say that all anarchists I know are, are good at this. Right. <laughs> like, uh, you know, a, a lot of anarchists take on too much. Uh, burn themselves out and yeah. also you know like we end up in in relationships that aren't aren't healthy for us um it's not like an easy practice but i did notice like that um in my life around anarchists when i uh say you know if someone invites me to do something and i'm like you know i don't i don't want to do it, it sounds really fun um i wish i could do it but I, I don't i don't get like the same kind of like people like would take your no um uh, at face value, um, without all that kind of guilt, like that kind of codependent guilt stuff that people project onto people. Right. Um, and then, and then, like though we do tend to burn ourselves out in the kind of organizing work we do, I think also people know that and then respect when people have to to take a break because right. you just can't be like fighting forever. Um, but then, yeah, this translates into relationships, um, and you know, it's a, it's. <laughs> I mean, I always joke to, to people, to my students and stuff that, uh, like, you know, there's never, it's never a bad idea to break up, you know, like most breakups, they're sad, they can be really, uh, you know, have a grieving process ar- around it, but usually yeah. if that's like, on, if that's uh, on the table, there's, there's probably a reason for it, and, and, and you learn from these things too, right, you learn from, from ending and starting things anew. And I think this is also just like part of the flexibility of anarchism that's so important in terms of like affinity group organizing where you're not trying to create these institutions or structures that last forever, but that are based on people coming together because they want to be together for this project and they last as long as the project and then they go away. And that way the power doesn't adhere like right. in that structure. Yeah, because yeah, if uh, we're all used to like these hierarchical power structures, so if we get rigid in our way of 
being together, they can form be- just because that's the way we're used to functioning in society. I mean, yeah, even just in a kind of like, you know, a relationship, like a a romantic relationship or even close friends, you can see that there's power structures that play out. I mean, specifically like uh, in romantic relationships, I mean, honestly, whether or not you're you're straight, um, we are so inundated with a kind of heterosexual model of of relationship that has a patriarchal uh, underpinning that, uh, you know, relationships get kind of portrayed as power struggles. Um, And though I do think there's like some queer ways that, uh, you know, there's like queer precedent for not falling into that, queer people fall into it as well. (laughs) Um, So yeah, just like looking at the power in your relationships um, and whether they're, you know, whether they're friends or not. And also I think like not valuing romantic partnership over Mm -hmm. other kinds of relationships because... Um, you know, I'm not saying don't have a romantic partner or even like not be, be monogamous, whatever, but like you shouldn't exclude your friendships um, right. f- or other kinds of relationships from from the importance and like hierarchies, hierarch- hierarchize them that way. Like this is the most important thing and everything else is like lesser. Right. Yeah, that's and that's too often the way that things go is that people, they get into a relationship and then they suddenly forget that they have friends for months and months and months. And then they realize that this one relationship doesn't cover every need that I have. <laughs> right. The love Island where you just disappear. Um, and then friends resent you. I mean, everyone, yeah, everyone's experienced both sides of that. I feel like, um, yeah. and I mean, there's something beautiful about that, of course, but like, but you know, those kinds of things, they dissipate, right. Which is another way of like modeling the kind of end of things. Even if you like, if you have a long-term relationship, you might've had the, like the honeymoon period or whatever. And then you like f- figure out your daily flow. Like that's something that ended and you move on to the next phase of the relationship. Right. Um, and I think that's something to learn from too, you know, the intensity and then the, the, the sort of day to day, which, you know, modeling on an anarchist, way, like we can think about the intensity of like being in an action, being in the streets together, which prefigures the kind of world we want to create in terms of like these, intense um like super present relationships they form bonds with the people that we're working with like whether or not a protest or whatever you're involved in like is successful something happens that you like that is really important and we need to figure out how to relate that to our daily lives which seems like much more mundane and uninteresting i think there's lessons to bring from the, those intense uh you know out of time moments for sure yeah it's uh yeah, that's interesting. Like, uh, I I also – one of the things that I have trouble with as, like, applying anarchism to my day-to-day life is, like, uh, my parenting roles. Like, that's mm-hmm. something that I I was parented in a very rigid way. And then uh, I had – I have two older kids that I kind of learned anarchism as they were getting into their teenage years. And now I've got two little ones and I find myself reverting back to the way I was parenting my – other my older kids when they were little which is much more like do as i say <laughs> <You Yeah. know? laughs> so it's a it's a tough thing to like always maintain in our in one's life i guess yeah i mean just in general another thing i think that's important when we think about anarchism is that it isn't demanding um perfection from us like you know again this is a difference i, I take with a, a kind of blueprint blueprint revolutionary theories where like this is the way to do things like anarchism is like a kind of experimentation where you are going to mess up and you do better right like we have accountability for when people do something right. shitty and then we like work on it together we're, no one's going to be perfect but in terms of parenting i mean god like I, yeah, I have parent a, a child and like, it really puts you face to face with your authoritarian impulses. Just be like, <laughs> yeah. you know, whether it's just like, you gotta, you gotta swoop in sometimes if a kid's going to get hurt. Right. Um, right. There's like literally like you're protecting someone's body and there's like control over that you have to face. But other things, just like the inconvenience of like a child's desire conflicting with your desire. Um, and, and like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like being like, I, I, well, I want quiet now, you know, but the kids, like kid wants to talk or play, right? Um, like just, I mean, as an example, like when you say no, it's, it can be arbitrary and, it, and there's a conflict there that you have to kind of face. Um, I'm not saying also like you can't say no sometimes, but like uh, or impose like some kinds of boundaries. Like I don't think all boundaries are, are harmful. I think boundaries are good. 
Um, but right. but yeah, it's like, it's like you got to think about why are you doing this thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and I mean, just in in the parenting thing, it's like uh, they don't have the same communication ability as uh, an adult or a teenager, even. So you got to be, you got to account for that in the way that you deal with their, uh, when they're younger, with their issues and, you know, trying to control them. <laughs> right. You find ways to like listen and understand. I mean, yeah. So another, you can fulfill like, their needs more, right? Like, <laughs> right. I mean, this is something that I learned from my partner, um, who I think is better at this than me, um, that like, that when, there's something else, like a, a problem, like there's a genuine need, right? That a kid is it's going to be uh, uh, expressing, whether you understand it or not, too, right? Like we might not understand it, especially when a kid's like not fully verbal or, or whatever. Um, and so respecting or honoring that, like that need, and that 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 as a child, especially a little one, that they're unable to fulfill them fully by themselves, that that's like something for you to do to to work with them. Um, I think that's really helpful because like yeah you find yourself when being inconvenienced or just like you know wanting to impose boundaries that are, are for your for your own good um and uh and i think like yeah i mean every time that i can contradict that in myself it's it's, it's probably good for the kid because they 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 have a sense of their own freedom and also that their word is respected that their desires are heard um, and that they can kind of craft the world around them. And I think that, like, I don't know, the other main thing I think anarchism should teach us is, like, this is one of the unexamined sort of major hierarchies of, like, adults over children, um, yeah. you know. Uh, and children are, like, good anarchists because they're, they're ready to, like, they don't, know all, they don't know all the rules, they're ready to break them, they question everything, you know. <laughs> it's like, you want to promote that in them, even if it's, if it's against your own uh, words, <laughs> yeah, you know. that's right. Yeah. I, um, we have a four-year-old and she's very good at saying no when she doesn't want to do something. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, uh, sometimes it can be frustrating, but it's also very good for her to have that ability. Right. Yeah. I mean, one of the stressful things around that that I've talked about, and we're getting into parenting, but like when a kid doesn't want to eat, right. It's like, okay, how much do you like make a kid eat? not how much food but like how much work you put into making kid eat because you feel like that's what they need to survive but like like you know parent other, other people who've parented have told me like a kid's not gonna their kid's not gonna starve themselves i mean unless maybe there's something serious going on but like typically a kid's not gonna starve themselves so like yeah. forcing a kid to eat is like not a you don't want to be doing that like ultimately that it feels yeah. really bad when you try to do something like that um and i've been stuck there before you know yeah for sure uh, I guess for more about the book, um, it wasn't just about uh, relationships and it wasn't just about uh, like, uh, I, I think, uh, what was it? The first uh, chapter was, am I already doing anarchy? And I found that very helpful for like a framing of like the way that we live uh, just in day to day. Like how, when I go to work, the behavior I have at work, am I being an anarchist at work as much as I can? Right. Yeah, I mean, that's another way that I really engage with the idea of anarchism. You know, I said that, like, we experiment, and so there's a way that's, like, aspirational that we're, like, trying to, to trying to embody anarchism, but I think, I really like Cindy Milstein's idea of, like, anarchism as an ethical compass, um, and I, I kind of, play, I rip off of some of the, that kind of perspective. I talk about, like, a kaleidoscope shift, or, like, it's just, like, a way to relate to all aspects of your life that isn't perfection, and I, I, I think it's important to be like there's ways that i'm already doing this like that I'm, it's not something like i have to like dig out dig out and like tell myself i'm doing wrong um but like but what it does and adds to like is like every instance of every interaction with the world or people is a place where you can promote kind of mutual freedom so you're not gonna you're not gonna win every situation like win freedom in every situation but could you do something that would help to uh you know someone else's ability to be free or, or your own kind of autonomy um and that could come from like spreading resources getting access to things um you know like recognizing someone's like just seeing someone right seeing someone for who, who they are um, right yeah 
Yeah, yeah no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Like, uh, it's sometimes tough. I, I, I like to say the, the experimenting kind of angle of things rather than expecting perfection of ourselves because it is hard uh, when you're working with people day to day and you only see a certain side of them or you only see somebody when you're getting coffee at the, you know, coffee shop to really know them in a way. Right. So you don't know where, what to say all the time and you can't like quote unquote radicalize everybody, I guess. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, well, there's, okay. So there's like the radicalizing that's kind of proselytization or like um, proselytization or, um, you know, propaganda, like just being like, read this pamphlet or let me just like lecture you. Like that, I mean, that might be effective in some ways. I mean, I think about like the Black Panther, the, you know, everyone always kind of cites the Black Panther breakfast program as like a place where you're like doing something that fulfills a need in a political way, doing political education during that. I think there's something that can be said um, in terms of like, for me, one of the things that is very important is kindness right like like um the world alienates us from each other as a capitalist state world and alienates us from each other through our jobs through you know commodification um also through just this idea that like we need to compete with each other to get ours right and that everyone's going to do that and it, you know there are people that you need to like shut down but um i think like ways of like into engaging with people in a kind way kind doesn't mean like and this is something i've been talking about with some friends kind is maybe different than nice like nice being like social niceties or whatever right, like politeness um, or whatever yeah just like kindness is like generosity or something right um uh and like i think that's like a model behavior um and and it creates space like you know this is a way that i engage with my, my world and the people around me is like is through a kind of a, an attempt to create space through kindness and generosity that like brings people together i think that's like that's like um one way to do it and it, and, it, and if we can name that anarchism or some aspect of anarchism not in my it's in totality um, then we can like politicize that that the um the, the way that we relate to each other and engage each other on these daily basis um are um you know like can can open up spaces to change the world and you know thinking about the people that you engage with that you don't know i mean there's another thing they're just like, acknowledging that too right like giving people the benefit of the doubt um you know, you have a shitty interaction with someone um, and uh, you can just like write that person off and be like, that person is that, that interaction. But most of us are like, like beaten down throughout our lives, right? And like dialing in our work and like whatever. Um, so, so giving people the benefit of the doubt, I think, and like knowing that there's like a whole person behind there that you can't fully know is, is a good step. You know, even with the people that you're intimate with, there's like, there's a whole part of that person you'll never, never never access you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure uh i'm sorry to interrupt our our chat here a little bit but i'm getting some echoing and i think uh are you using bluetooth headphones yeah yeah i'm using bluetooth, using bluetooth. i think sometimes i get uh, uh i think that's that's what causes like almost a weird echo back and forth i'm not sure if there's a way let me try something out there we go uh, <laughs> yeah. i had to reallow the um Reallow permission from my screen uh, microphone to get to the the computer mic. It was using the headphone mic. Ah, well, it sounds good now. So <laughs> okay, C cool. Sorry about that. Ah, no worries. Yeah, I I've had a couple interviews in the past where it happened, and I wasn't sure what the cause was, but I'm I'm starting as the more I do it, the more times it happens, the more I piece it together that I think it's the Bluetooth. This time I think it's this mic because I had the, I've never had the problem before uh, oh, okay. with this adapter and I was getting an echo. Yeah, I don't know. Um, okay. Yeah. So I guess uh, 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 where can people find the the book? Well, I mean it's put out by Pluto Press, so um, you can go on the Pluto Press website. If you go to my website too, sjbranson.com, there's a link to the book and other stuff that I've done. You can check out like talks and writings. Um, and then, you know, whatever radical bookstore is a good place to go. Like, you know, I, I did a, a my launch event at Firestorm Books, which is in Asheville, North Carolina. They're a anarchist, queer, collectively owned um, bookstore and community space. 
Cool. Um, so like, you know, I always say buy it through an, a, a bookstore that like a local rad shop, you know? Yeah. For, preferably, eh? Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's various <laughs> ways to get it, of course. Better than Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's on there, so you could do it, but, um, yeah. and if you, you know, it's not everyone, not everyone's lucky to have like a, an info shop or a bookstore that carries all that stuff, you know? Yeah. I know. Stuff. Like, uh, I'm in Regina, Saskatchewan. Uh, we don't have, a, a any kind of radical bookshops in Regina. Yeah. Uh, there's one in Saskatoon, but that's a two and a half hour drive. <laughs> right. <laughs> so not, not everybody's going mean, to get over you, there. You can get shipping through some of these places, but yeah, I mean, whatever. Get it however you want, you know? Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Well, I guess we're coming up 25-ish minutes. We're almost halfway through our time. Uh, let's do some counter-propaganda. Okay. So for counter-propaganda, you've got, uh, uh, we. I guess the intention is to counter the anti-trans stuff that's going on. And, uh, it's, yeah, trans people are really under attack, especially in like, uh, the U S and, and Canada because our connection to the U S. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I'm thinking about a lot right now is that in the U S we just had the overturning of Roe or in the summer of Roe right. versus Wade, which is now re, you know, it overturned the legalization of abortion, which is allowing states, individual states within the United States to criminalize abortion further and further. Um, and, I, you know, I, th I, I think that's really connected to the attacks on trans people through ideas of healthcare, through ideas of bodily autonomy, through concerns um, by like the fascists about the great replacement and like, you know, white right. genocide because they want, um, they're scared that trans kids are going to like become infertile or whatever. Um, and I, I just think it's really important to not to learn the lessons of the failure of the pro-choice movement to stop Roe from being overturned and to, and to put all of its focus in like courts and litigation and policy measures. Um, because I think we could, as trans people, we could like focus everything on like courts and like overturning the policies in the States and, and figure out a more like anarchist feminist mm -hmm. way of, of, uh, of like, creating the networks of care that we need, um, you know, rather than hoping, cause you know, whatever we get from the state, whatever we rest from the state it can be taken Always back taken on a whim. Away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I just think that, yeah, it's a turning point right now and it's scary. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's just something I've been thinking about. No, I, under I can uh, understand that. I, I, I've had a few like, uh, trans femme uh, friends since my days in the atheist community. So it's always been something that's on been on my mind. Like, and it's been getting gradually, like if there was almost a time where it wasn't like even covered in right-wing media <laughs> and then it's just, right. it's been worse and worse and worse all the time. And it's just, it's incredibly like scary if you have, if you're a, a trans person or, or somebody who is, you know, cares about trans people. Yeah. It's become the like new tool of moral panic. Um, especially, you know, it's another version of save our children that, um, right. that they did that in the seventies and eighties around gay people. And like, you can always, it's a, it's a good tool <laughs> for power. <laughs> and then because so few people, like, I think a lot of people don't really know trans people, um, personally, uh, they can, they can use that as a, as a real scare tactic because, um, people don't tend to have that firsthand experience. And I mean, some people do, of course, but yeah, uh, trans but people are a real a minority, you know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think like I was, uh, uh Joe fucking Rogan just had Matt Walsh on his show, uh, like not that long ago. And, and he, he like, I think there's like a thousand people who are going for like, uh, what was it? Top surgery. <laughs> like in yeah. the whole, whole country of the United States. And that's, that's the outrage that Mount Walsh has, right? He's, he's targeting a thousand people or like, you know, right. a few thousand people that are, are dealing with this, uh, with, with dysphoria and, and what have you. And then this, uh, marginalization, you know? Yeah. I mean, right. And it's the same thing with like the sports stuff. They're like, they're like passing these laws, banning people from sports. And then you look into it and there's like, no trans athletes in the state or whatever. Like they're not actually, there's <laughs> yeah. nothing actually going on there. 
I think yeah. so in terms of counter propaganda though, this is what I, I would say. And this is stuff I've been writing my, the new stuff I'm writing is about this, but like, you know, um, one of the things they're afraid of is because they, there's been statistics to say the number of trans people is going up. Right. Um, and this has always been a fear around queerness is that like are queer people, you know, gay, trans, whatever, um, like a specific person that's like born that way or, or can you be converted? Right. And <laughs> I, I want to say like, yes, we are a social contagion, right? Like <laughs> there are more trans people because they see trans people. It's not because yeah. trans people abuse people. It's because like the possibilities of life um, are like, you know, and the desire to like be, to live differently is, is real. Right. And that's true yeah. for gay people and, you know, queer people and trans people. Like, I, I think we got to embody that threat to the social order and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's I, right. We, <laughs> <laughs> we are turning people trans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I like that. Uh, and it, it is, it does seem like logically uh, consistent to say like, if people see, they feel a certain way and then they see more trans people in the media and in the world, then they feel like, hey, I can uh, fulfill those feelings or I can live that way that I want to live. I don't have to be oppressed by the system, by people, other, you know, the status quo. Right. Yeah. It's just like shows you that there's other possibilities and like trans also like people do trans just transition in so many different ways. And it's not just one, one thing once and for all. Yeah. So like, like we don't even know what most people don't even know what they're talking about. Right. When they, when they're talking about this, they, they can focus right. on the surgeries and the hormones and um, which is part of it. But yeah, it's just, yeah. Like, I don't know. And I think it's true just also for like, just, you know, for same sex desire or whatever you want to call it. Cause like, you know, when people are like, oh, I don't have to like, just like, you know, want to have <laughs> sex to make babies. Like I could do, yeah. do it with other people, like whatever. Like, I don't know. I don't have to define myself through this also. Yeah, like, that's right. Yeah. It's like, it's enticing. <laughs> yeah. It's like the, uh, what are they like the rise of like, uh, kind of like the increase in people identifying as pansexual among like younger people because they just see like, well, I don't have to be this one thing all the time, forever and ever. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. And which goes back to the book about like breakup and stuff. Like, you know, yeah. like every kind of relationship you get in doesn't have to be this choice that you make that you have to live with forever. Just like, you know, capitalism and the state aren't forever, you know, like they're yeah. going to end. They've only been around for a while. Like we need to remember that things end, that things have a time span and that's true like on these small scales and larger scales um yeah you know so no for sure um so i guess uh we'll move on to foes and comrades <laughs> so for uh comrades you have defend atlanta forest yeah uh, that's a great i'm oh, sorry i was just gonna ask what is defend atlanta forest that's a great uh, project. There's a couple of different groups down there. Um, Defend Atlanta Forest, Stop Cop City um, in okay. Atlanta, Georgia, uh, in the United States. There's a project to cut down the biggest forest in, in the city to make a training uh, camp for police that simulates a city. So, you know, where they can work on subduing, you know, civilians in the, in the urban areas of the, of the states. Um, and they're also trying to build sound stages, I think, for for film because George is making a lot of money as a location for um, movies. Oh, OK. Um, so there's a, it's a kind of grouping of different um, projects to defend a forest. So it has an ecological aspect to stop police brutality and, and propose an abolitionist um you know, view of things because this space was also a plantation and a, and a work farm, uh, work, sorry, a prison farm. Um, okay. Wow. So it has like the, uh, the legacy of like racial slavery and, um, mass incarceration. Um, and, uh, and then anti-capitalists just thinking about how like the movie industry is coming to like kind of just destroy the lives of the people who live there to make profit for some of the people who own things there. So it's a really cool project and people are there in the forest, um, countering, uh, the developers. Um, and I, similarly, there's another project going on in, in Michigan, which closer, closer to Canada. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's called uh, stop camp grayling where there's a, a national guard training space. That's also rented out to private military contractors. Uh, they want to expand to, um, 
you know, just expand their training camp. Um, okay. And they're trying to take a kind of a, ho- a holistic view about how this is like um, a place of ecological um, destruction, extraction of resources for capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. So they're another group doing similar. It's There's two projects in the States now that I think are to keep an eye on, you know, right, and, right. and plug in if you can. Yeah. It sounds like, uh, yeah, I guess it's, Capitalists destroying ecology <laughs> for their own profit. It's just the thing they do, right? Yeah. Why would we need this? Earth? We'll just blast <laughs> off, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We can just bulldoze some trees or whatever, flatten some land. and Yeah. And then go yeah, mine some asteroids or I don't know, <laughs> whatever they think they're going to do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because at some point the infinite growth has to expand, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. And there won't be a place to live, but yeah. So, I mean, there's some people trying to do cool things and, you know, um, that's, that's, that's hopeful, even though, I mean, ultimately we're already past a point of like some form of destruction. Um, there's ways and spaces to, to counter those projects of, of extraction and and killing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's good that there's groups doing that. Like, uh, like I, I often think of the land defenders uh, in BC uh, trying to like block the pipelines from being uh, put up or put in and, and like the, the way that sometimes everybody will wake up one morning and bulldozer will be da- destroyed in some way. <laughs> and it's like, right. this is, that's good work. People doing good work, trying to protect the environment in some way. I love when bulldozers just magically get destroyed overnight. It's great. Yeah, I, I think it's amazing. It's it's just yeah. one of those. It's like the gods just picked it up and. <laughs> yeah, go, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So I guess uh, is there anything that uh, we haven't touched on that we should uh, mention? Um, I mean, there's a million things. Obviously, we could talk obviously, about a lot of yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, you know, I'm I'm really interested in in sharing uh, this book with people, and uh, so if people want to read it, I'd love i love that, and and you can tell me what you think about it. I have a, a website, uh, and I, and you can ca- contact me through there. My email emails on there, and then um, and also I do a podcast, also um, the Final Straw Radio. Okay. Uh, which has been around for a while. I'm a newer co-host, but it's an anarchist radio show and podcast. So if you okay. like what I have to say, you can hear me talk more. There. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, when did you join uh, Final Straw? I started doing stuff a couple of years ago, off and on, and then now I'm a more regular co-host. Um, okay. So, yeah, I don't do, I do some of them. You know, we have different people doing interviews. I do some of the interviews, but it's, it's okay. a good group of people too. I, I, I recommend the other people. They're, they're wonderful, you know. Um, How long has that as, as a project been going on? Over a decade. Is um, that right? Wow. Yeah. And it, it airs on radio in Asheville, on Asheville FM, um, and in some other places, which I don't remember off the top of my head, but then also it's like a podcast. So it's cool that it has like a terrestrial radio um, yeah, component as well. I often, uh, one of the things that I always get hung up on is like the fact that like the right wing radio, like talk radio sphere uh, is part of why the world is the way it is right now. And I always wonder if we could do something like that on the left or like through uh, other alternative means. And I, I, so it's nice to hear that like an anarchist radio show is on actual radio. (laughs) Yeah. You can, uh, in the right day and time of the right hour, you flip through the the station, you can hear (laughs) some, some radical stuff. And, and the project's cool because like we, we talk to people who write books and stuff and also people who are doing, who are doing campaigns or actions and report backs from it's inter it's really international, right? Like where we, we, we get to talk to people from around the world. So that's important to just kind of making those connections about what people are doing in other spots on the globe, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's like, uh, I listen to a couple like, uh, specifically like anarchist news type, uh, radio shows. And it, it's always good to know what's happening in like Russia, actual, see what the anarchists in Russia are doing or like anarchists down in, uh, Iran or, you know, like actually yeah. all worldwide. Cause we are a, a whole bunch, like, we're a global community, right? 
Yeah. And we got to have solidarity. And, um, and I think we can learn from each other in terms of like improvising tactics and, uh, and not everything works is not everything's like translatable to every context, but, right. um, but, you know, part of that experimentation thing, just see what people are trying because, you know, no one solved the, the, the problem of, of capitalism in the state yet, but there's ways to kind of put chinks in the armor at least. Yeah, for sure. So I guess we kind of covered a, a little bit about where people can find you. Uh, is there anywhere else? Like uh, you're on Twitter? Are you yeah, on Mastodon yet? <laughs> I'm not on Mastodon. I mean, like I'm not a great social media user. I'm on Twitter. Mostly uh, if you follow me on Twitter, it's like SJ Branson one. And I, I promote things that I'm doing. If you want to like talk and, or, and promote other projects and um, that I think are cool. I'm not like, doing my hot takes because I don't find Twitter a really good place for engaging in thought. It tends to, and even the anarchists there tend to upset me because they get caught in that, like Fair. sort of like, just like making people feel bad about things, um, which isn't my <laughs> approach. Um, but yeah, I'm on there and I'm on uh, Instagram at Scott Branson blurred words. But again, it's like mostly I kind of promote like the things that I'm involved in and, um, and, and other people's stuff and mutual aid stuff. But, Oh, you know, follow cool. me, but I do you want to see my art. It's on the, on the Instagram. Um, yeah. Very cool. Well, I guess, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thanks, Corey. I'm really happy to talk to you and, and get to meet you. And, um, thanks for inviting me and yeah. Uh, it was a, it was a great conversation. I'll, I'll show everybody the book. That's practical anarchism. <laughs> yeah. Cat, Cat Sins did a really cool cover for it. So yeah, it's very it pops cool. out at you. Yeah. Yeah. Get, get the book, read it, uh, do a reading group and invite me and I'll come talk, talk with you. I'm doing, a, I'm doing book clubs with people. Um, so yeah, uh, I want to get in conversations, you know, that would be very cool. Actually. I, I'm, uh, I'm part of a, a local reading group. We just meet on discord. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to recommend that this be our next book. Uh, and then maybe we can get you to come and chat. Yeah, for sure. Let me know. I'm happy to do stuff like that. Um, right that's the point. You know, I like writing, but I want to like, you know, I, I want to write for a purpose, which is to engage with other people, you know? So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm happy to do that stuff. Yeah. It's like, I, I enjoy doing this show, but I, I, my goal is to actually build community, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, totally. Yeah. Oh, right on. Well, thank you again. And we'll talk to you soon. Yep. Bye, Corey. Have a good day. All right, that's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Uh, thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me spend more time on this and my other project. If you want to contribute to all of that, then you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating and a review on the podcast app of your choice would be great. If you want to find out more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes uh, for links to all of my stuff and check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. Um, there you can check out my other show, From Many People's Strength, uh, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, the videos I do with my uh, friend Damien Marie at Hope, and all my old content from the Brainstorm podcast. Uh, you can also find links to my Discord, Reddit, and Twitch. You can contact me through my website or by emailing mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. Thanks so much for listening and or watching. So, and make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Go join a local org or uh, print off some posters and pamphlets and spread some propaganda.